Hey, this is Hunter with Lone Star Woodworking, and in this video, I do a second project where I test out a new pigment for my epoxy. I try out a new technique for inlaying some stabilizing hardware, and in the process, hopefully build a pretty cool looking table. So for this build, I was commissioned to build a 30 inch wide by 80 inch long dining table. So I went to Algoa Millworks and I started shopping around for slabs that fit that description and also fit the client's budget that they established. I think I sent him five or six different species to choose from. I gave him pros and cons of each one, how well they hold up under certain climates and how finicky they can be in you know, a house that's going to go from 75 during the day to 65 at night. And the only reason I say that is because that's what my house does. Anyway, in the end, we landed on these two incredibly figured pieces of white ash. And if you know anything about this species, you know that incredibly figured is not a phrase that is used to describe white ash. Oftentimes, the phrase that is used to describe white ash is, eh? You know, it's just not very interesting. It, it's usually a very straight-grained, very low-key type of wood. And if you were to pass by a piece of furniture where it's just a piece of ash, it probably wouldn't catch your eye unless you did something special to it, like ebonize it or something crazy to it. But these two pieces had some incredible pieces of grain features to them. And in fact, the big one actually has a grain feature that I don't know how to describe. I've never seen it before. So I'm gonna show it to you here in a minute. And if you know what it is, please let me know because I still don't know and I'm very curious. So what you've seen me do leading up to this point is pretty much just break down the slabs into their rough dimensions that I need for the epoxy pour. I'm cutting them at 81 inches long so that way I have a half inch buffer to trim off any excess once the epoxy has cured. And for the grain orientation or river orientation, apologies, river orientation, he wanted two rivers that run the length of the table, which means that one of these slabs has to get ripped straight down the center. And this big one right here is the one I'm choosing to keep whole. And that is that grain feature that I was talking about. It almost looked like, looks like the grain is a spiral or kind of folds back in on itself. I don't know how to describe that and I've never seen it before and no Google search has really been very helpful. So if you know what that is, go ahead and let me know because it's not curl, it's not quilting, it's not chatoyancy. I don't know what it is. But that's the one I decided to keep whole simply because it was more interesting. So I took out my T-square, put a nice straight line on the one that I wanted to rip in half and did exactly that, ripped it in half. And there's nothing special about the cut other than I plunged my track saw all the way down without making any shallow cuts, and it's just incredibly satisfying watching it come out of the end grain, but generally you want to make a couple of shallow cuts in order to cut it safely. And here is my first look at the orientation of the rivers. Now those two smaller pieces were still a little wide, I was going way over that 30 inches of width. So I had to trim them down by about five inches each. And with that straight edge that the track saw ripped, all I had to do was run that straight edge along the fence of my table saw. Now, a lot of you more safety minded folk out there are probably looking at this, wondering why I am just operating my table saw at face height with a clearly oversized piece of wood, just begging for a piece of kickback in the face. And I don't really have a good answer for you. The only answer that I have is that I needed the room, so I broke down the dedicated rolling cart that my table saw was on, so that way I had more room to move around, and plus I'm going to be building myself a new workbench here pretty soon, and I needed the space to work on that as well, so that's why I had to operate my table saw that way. It's not a great answer, it's not even a good answer, uh, but it's the answer I got. Now these two smaller pieces had some chainsaw marks right here. So there were some really ugly straight edges on them that I had to kind of grind down and make look more natural. And the way you can do this is getting your pencil out and then kind of tracing along the grain as it runs down the piece of wood. And the reason that I say do that and then grind it down to that line is because if you try to just freehand and fake that live edge, chances are 
it's going to be pretty easy to tell that it's man-made. And again, nothing particularly special happening here. I'm just breaking down the melamine, getting it ready for the epoxy form. And the method that I'm going to use to attach the sides of it is not new, but it's new to me. Um, I'm going to be drilling some pocket holes and then attaching the sides of the form from the top. And the reason I'm doing this is because like a lot of you, I watch Blacktail Studio. And he put out a video where he said that building your forms like this is inherently stronger than building your forms the way I've been doing it, where you just slap the sides of the form to the sides of the base and then screw it directly into the melamine. So I decided to go ahead and give it a try. I'll be honest, I didn't notice any major difference in the amount of time it took to build the form. In fact, it probably took a little bit less time, but not a significant amount. Um, and I can see why this is a little bit more secure and gives you more insurance with the leaking or with, with leaks. You know, it, it basically ensures that you don't get them because you have that beta caulk that's on the inside. You have the beta caulk that you smushed between the side of the form and the base of the form. And then you have the beta caulk that is on the outside of the form. So you have three beads of caulk that are basically making it a watertight form and ensuring that you do not get leaks. And here you can see that my measurements were right on the dot, super tight tolerances. And I said I was going to be doing a second project in conjunction with this dining table. And it's been a couple of months in the making, as you can see there, uh, blowing out the form. It's been collecting dust for a few months now. And you can even see that the piece of wood that I'm going to be using for it, which is a piece of sycamore crotch, has already been cut to actually fit right inside of that form. And I can't remember why I had to put this off, but I just know that it's been quite a few months since I've had to get it out, as you can tell by all the wood that's just piled on top of it. And I'm not going to go too in-depth on this because this is just kind of an experiment that I wanted to make you all aware of. This isn't a video that I'm making. This isn't a dedicated video. Maybe I'll do one later on. But the test that I'm doing here is using activated charcoal as a mica powder pigment. And what I'm looking for is I do not want swirls. I want solid black because... I don't like the swirling of mica powder pigments. It's just not my preference or anything like that. So that's what I'll be testing. And what I'm doing first is mixing up a bucket of the dye and a bucket of the activated charcoal side by side because I want to see if there was any major initial difference between the way they looked mixed up. And to my pleasant surprise, I didn't think there was. I don't think that you would be able to guess which one is which if I set these two buckets in front of you and made you guess which one was which. Now, I don't want to make anybody put all their eggs in that basket, but that project is dried now. It's cured and it's out of the form, but I haven't planed it and I haven't finished it. So I can't tell you with 100% confidence that it worked really well, but I can tell you that from the curing process and from what I can see now, it did dry jet black. So I'm kind of excited to get that done. And I'll update you guys on my social media as I get that done and progress through it. But after a couple of weeks, I went back outside and busted this big table out of the form. And at this point in my videos, I'm normally setting up my flattening jig. And so you might be asking yourself, Hunter, why are you not setting up your flattening jig? Well, don't worry your pretty little head about it because I am going back to Algoa Millworks to have them flatten it for me. I don't know why this didn't occur to me to do much, much earlier. I've been shopping with them for years and I've known that they've built these kind of tables and I've known that they flattened them. But I just for some reason didn't think to ask if this was a service that they offer. And lo and behold, it is. And they got this done in like 45 minutes. This normally takes me two or three days. And so the amount of time that I am saving is huge. And this may not look pretty, but again, the amount of time that I am saving by not having to flatten this myself and only do the touch-ups 
is weeks because I'm only able to go out into my garage every couple of days. So three days in the garage is actually like a week and a half. So that's how much time they save me. And I'm going to hit this really quick. This is how accurate the wind track saw system is. I get a lot of questions on this, and this is the quality of the cut that you get. So I highly recommend it. All right, moving on to the second kind of new thing that I've been doing with my table building. I'm going to be using this angle iron in lieu of C-channel. And I saw a guy do this on Instagram like a year and a half ago or something like that, and I thought it was a really good idea and for some reason just never tried it. Now, I did make a small mistake here, but in case you didn't catch it, I'll let the ugly dude who's been on your screen for like 10 minutes explain really quick. Okay, so if you're a little bit more observant than the average bear, you saw that whenever I first showed you how this bit, which is an inch in diameter, should fit onto this V-bar, which is what I'm using instead of C-channels, you'll have noticed that the bit fits inside of the angle iron. That's obviously not what we want, and I noticed that a little too late. The good news is that I can go bigger, and that's a better mistake to make than having to go smaller, because as we all know, especially when it comes to wood and epoxy, you can always take more material off, but you can't add any more material once it's gone. So I ordered this big thing, and tested it out already so you can clearly see that it fits nicely outside of the angle iron. So we're going to try that again and hopefully get it right this time. All right, so all I did was chuck up that bigger bit and take a single pass to remove the rest of the material that I needed to inlay the angle iron. And here you'll be able to see that it fit beautifully. I was actually very, very happy with this and it was super satisfying to drop that thing in there and just watch it fit nice and neat. From there, it was pretty much business as normal when it comes to attaching C channels or angle iron or whatever it is you choose to use. The only difference is you're doing it at a 45 degree angle instead of straight up and down. Now I did also take the extra step of painting it black, painting the angle iron black because right off of the Home Depot shelves, it's kind of ugly. I mean, it's made for construction. It's not made to be pretty, but for the use of this table, I wanted it to look kind of nice. Now we already knew that I was going to have a ton of these little touch-ups, but again, the amount of time that I'm saving by not having to flatten it is more than worth it. So I'm mixing up a little bit of tabletop epoxy with some activated charcoal to fill in some of the pits that were uncovered during the planing process and fill in the pits that were left over from the blade in the epoxy. From there, I just had to wait a day, come back out and sand it all off flush with the wood. And from there, I started work working my way up to 120 grit, filling in these little imperfections as I went. But as I started going up, I started noticing these little white spots underneath the epoxy. And so I wet it down a little bit. And if you go back and you watch my video titled, I finally impressed my wife, I ran into this problem there too. It's like trapped air bubbles or something below the surface that you just gotta dig out. I tried using my Dremel at first, but it just didn't have the power to get through the epoxy and it kept dying. So I had to get my angle grinder out with a wire wheel and really dig out that material. Just be really careful if you choose to do this because it's really easy to go too far and either go too deep in the epoxy or go too far to one side and go into the wood. But after I got that done, all I had to do was come back, sand, scrape, get it nice and even, and it looked great. And if you'll notice, there was a little bit of a shadow there. And if you're new to this, that might be a little concerning and you can even see them right there. That might be a little concerning, but that's just where the epoxy got filled. And once you put the finish on, you can't even tell. Now I'm going to attach some metal flowy line legs. And I love flowy line. I love Alex. I think that he makes some absolutely awesome pieces of art with this. But I've been watching a lot of Four Eyes Furniture lately. 
and he makes some of the absolutely most insane pieces of table legs and table bases that I've seen out of wood. And I want to get on that level. I think that is so impressive and so cool to see. So I'm really hoping to add that skill to my personal toolbox going forward. It might be a couple of months, maybe even a year before I post a video of me building anything like that. But it's something I'm very excited to get into because it just looks so, so cool. And if you don't know who he is, go check out Four Eyes Furniture on YouTube. Now, after I apply that first coat of finish, I'm gonna go ahead and wipe off every last little bit of excess and let it cure for another day or two. After that, I'm gonna come back with my maroon pad and put the second coat of finish on. Now, I know I ran through this video kinda quick, and the reason being is that there just wasn't really a whole lot that was brand new in this video. So if there was something that I skipped over, something that you would like me to go over a little bit more in depth, go ahead and comment down below. We can have a conversation there. You can reach out to me on social media, anything like that. I don't mind it. I love engaging with you guys. It's always a whole lot of fun. Now, I am incredibly happy with this project, and unfortunately, I don't have pictures for you guys because the client wasn't quite ready for it. He's still moving into his house, so that's why. But guys, that's going to do it for the video. So if you enjoyed what you watched, I would really appreciate a like and subscribe. And I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you next time.